So I like to know who I'm talking to. So let me figure that out. Uh, who out here plays video games? Go ahead and raise your hand. Pretty much everybody. Um, who out here makes video games in some capacity? All right, less than half, but significant number of people. Who makes traditional video games, i.e. not social or casual games? All right, and, and who makes sort of some of the newer social, casual, Facebook, iOS kind of games. All right, so really a minority, good. So not too many people are going to want to lynch me by the end of this talk, but there's still maybe a couple. <laughs> let, me, let me go to my presentation. So, um, I've been a video game designer for a while now. Um, I, I work in that field, it's my field of expertise, and that's why I wanted to kick off this talk, obviously, by talking about uh, a subject like television. And not just television, but a specific subgenre of television, um, the hour-long drama. And I have drama in sarcasm quotes for a pretty good reason, as we will see. Um, and I don't even just want to talk about television shows like this one, which I enjoyed tremendously. Um, or this one, which received tremendous critical acclaim, or even this one, which is enthralling a lot of people right now. Um, but also, I want to turn the clock back to some time like the 70s or the 80s, when the things on TV were not like those. Instead, they were shows like this one, or this one, um, or this fabulous gem of a show that we just saw uh, before the talk. And it's important to understand, OK, who out here is old enough that maybe you're approximately my age and saw this on TV when it came out. Not that many people, but some of you are going to know where I'm coming from. Um, I was not scraping the bottom of the barrel to come up with this clip, okay? This was a big, big TV show. The Six Million Dollar Man in the mid-70s was a top 10 Nielsen rated show multiple years in a row. This is what Americans watched on television, and this particular clip was from a two-part episode called The Secret of Bigfoot. Um, I, I guess the secret of Bigfoot is that he's a robot controlled by the Lemurians or something, but, but this was a huge, big, promoted event. It was like, it, it was must-see TV of the time. Um, and, uh, but, but you see the quality level, right? I mean, but, but what, what's interesting to, to understand now, I mean, to look back with our modern perspective, and to realize people watched that non-ironically, right, in the 70s. They would go home and they would, they would turn on a, a show because they want to watch TV and that's what would be on. And then they, you know, you'd go to school the next day or go to work the next day and talk to your friends about how cool Bigfoot was, right, on that show. Um, and something changed, right? Uh, these shows on the top are markedly different from these shows on the bottom. Um, certainly in quality level, but also in terms of structure. It's not an accident that we have better TV today than we had in the 70s and 80s, because there was a structural change. Um, now, the making of TV shows is a complex and sprawling endeavor, um, and there's no way that I can do it justice, so I'm going to tremendously oversimplify and not look at most of it, but I'm just going to talk about two major structural things that affected those shows back then. Um, and, and help make them what they were, right? One of them was the need to have commercial breaks all through a show, and the other one was need for syndication. And what these did is change the basic content of the show, right? If you're, if you're making a show like The Six Million Dollar Man and you know there's gonna be commercial breaks, you can't just sort of pretend like you're making a 44-minute movie and then cut it up at the right points because 
at the very least, where those commercials land is going to be disruptive to the flow of your narrative, right? But actually, it's much worse than that because, you know, people didn't come to watch commercials. They came to watch your show. And there's lots of other stuff on TV. And anytime a commercial comes up, there's a strong incentive for someone to flip the channel. So what this means is that you start designing your narrative, um, you know, and, and editing the show and all kinds of things to try and keep people there through the commercials. Like that's when it becomes one of your main priorities um, as a creator of one of these shows. So um, you might do things like, well, how do we make people maximally interested right before the commercial and, and, and make them really care about what's going to happen so that they, they stick through it or at least come back if they flip to another channel for a few seconds? Well, we'll put a cliffhanger like right before the commercial break so you don't know what's going to happen and, and, and you really want to know. There were two of those in the clip that we saw, right? The first time uh, Steve Austin sees a Sasquatch and stares at him in a manly fashion. That's supposed to be a dramatic moment and you want to know how this is going to go down. And then at the end there when he was mind controlled or I don't know what that was. Um, you know, you, you feel like he's in trouble. And, and this is a standard structural thing that these shows would do all the time, right? So that's thing number one. Um, thing number two is the need for syndication. So the idea was, well, you want to make as much money off these shows as you can. They're a substantial investment. So after the first run, you want to be able to sell the show to a local station. Um, and you know that local station can play the show. And the belief for quite a long time was that you want to prevent people from being confused when they see a show that's in syndication. So you know, if you see Star Trek in the morning uh, before you go to work on one channel, and then you come home after work, and you see Star Trek on another channel, and they're showing even a totally different season, the thought was that you don't want people to be confused about what's happening. You don't want those to be incompatible. And so what syndication ended up doing was putting a constraint on the works that the world can't really change. Uh, you know, nothing huge could really happen. You have to sort of reset the universe at the end of every show so that the episodes are interchangeable. It doesn't matter what order you watch them in. And you get what's almost like a fast food experience. Like if, you, if you're going to go to McDonald's, you know what you're going to get before you get there. It's not like walking into a restaurant you've never been to. That's what syndication's for. Now, the important thing to realize, or one of many important things to realize, is that uh, both of these constraints um, take the making of a TV show away from being some kind of uh, you know, exercise of artistic expression and take it more and more into being an engineering problem, right? When you sit down to make a TV show, you're figuring out how to engineer a, a narrative and, and a displaying of that narrative that'll keep people through commercials and that'll be interchangeable with other instances of the same thing. And by the time you meet those constraints, those really strongly determine what you can create. And there's actually not that much room left over to do anything really interesting. Um, now, in addition to being structurally invasive, um, the, the slightly subtler thing is that these change your bearing toward the audience. They change your relationship with the audience. If you're going to make a movie, um, at least in some naive and oversimplified picture of movie making, once people pay for the movie and walk in the theater, you've kind of gotten what you want from them, right? And now it's you as the creator, the onus is on you to fulfill your end of the contract and um, give people a great experience that they feel is worth their money, right? But, but that's, there's something pure about that, right? Like your job is just to entertain people as best, as best you can. Um, well, and, and, and the way that this changes, of course, with, with something like television is that you stop treating the audience like your friends so much, right? You start, because you want something from them during the proceeding, right? You want them to stay there, so you're, you're kind of like manipulating them a little more. Now, the thing that this does to the genre of one hour dramas, and the reason I have sarcasm quotes around dramas is, you know, think about what's a drama. A drama is something that happens when there's a lot of risk. Something's on the line, like some characters stand to gain something, or some characters stand to lose something, or the world could change in some way that's irreversible. Something important is going to happen, right? But in this kind of syndicated show model, 
That's impossible. There can't be any stakes, there can't be any permanent change in the world because the episodes have to be interchangeable. And so you end up with something that's not a real drama, it's a fake drama. And this again changes the attitude that the author has toward the audience, right? In a real drama, you're trying to create something that's beautiful or dramatic or sad or, or something that, that you know, has some kind of truth to it. And in a fake drama, you want people to believe they're seeing something that's beautiful or sad, but, but there's really no skin in the game, there's nothing on the line, so you're kind of deceiving people more so than, than you do even in regular storytelling. So you can have a show like this where you, know, you as the writer are like, oh no audience, the Starship Enterprise is really in trouble this time, you've gotta believe us, right? But anyone who's seen the show isn't really gonna believe that because they know Wesley has to save the Enterprise by the end of the show, because it, otherwise it just wouldn't be Star Trek. Like that's just not what Star Trek is. Unless it's a two-part episode, in which case you save the Enterprise at the end of the second part. So this changed. Um, when uh, some major players, HBO probably most prominently, decided to change this model of what it, what it meant uh, to make these shows, right? And it's not an accident that HBO did this successfully because they were not subject to these same constraints that things like network television were subject to, right? Um, the selling point of HBO is there's no commercials. That's what you're paying them for when you subscribe. And, you know, they had this history of being the place that you go to see movies that you could have seen somewhere better, like in the theater. And at some point they said, well, we want to compete better than that in the marketplace. We want to have things that people can't see anywhere else. So we're going to produce our own shows. Um, and when they did that, they even doubled down and said, hey, since we're not subject to the same regulatory frameworks as all these network channels, we're going to be more gritty. You know, we're going to be more violent. We're going to have more overt sexuality. They did all this stuff. Um, you know, with shows like Oz and The Sopranos, and you eventually end up at today, um, where you have shows, shows like Game of Thrones, where the reason people love these shows is, is, uh, is because the, the world has so much on the line, like the world can change, important things can happen in this show, right? It's sort of the antithesis of what people in the 70s and 80s thought was a good idea. So, you know, you, you end up in a place where this scene can, who knows what scene this is? Probably a lot of people. This scene defines this show in the minds of many people now. It would have been completely impossible to do in the 70s or 80s along many axes, right? Because of consequence in the world, because of being disturbing, just all kinds of things. Um, okay, so, so really, to summarize that whole section, these constraints were invasive to the work, right? Um, and that changed the work that could be produced. And it's not even like if you were a good author or a good director, you could go and, and make a TV show that's just as good as a movie because they're different things, right? It took television to change before you could make higher quality stuff, and that change was structural. It wasn't just that people got better at making TV. That probably happened too. There were probably some really smart people doing good work, but it was the structural change that was important. Um, now, uh, there's some side effects to this. Um, one is that you know, the audience of television and the audience of cinema became different, right? The audience for television is like, well, kids who are home after school and are just goofing off or, you know, someone who comes home from work and they're tired and they just want to flip through channels. They're being entertained. They're getting this for free and so they don't have high expectations. They're just sort of wasting time, right? That's how you get shows like The Six Million Dollar Man. Um, cinema is totally different, right? You paid your seven to ten dollars a person, five to ten dollars depending on what year it was. Um, you maybe got a babysitter, you drove all the way to the theater, it was raining, it was a big hassle to get there. You got to get there early to get front seats. Your expectations are high, right? And again, that puts an onus on the creator to live up to your expectations that doesn't exist in the case of TV, at least in the 70s and 80s, right? So that then leads to a different culture of quality within the creators of the medium, right? Uh, you watch that clip of the Six Million Dollar Man and there's so many things about it that are astonishingly bad, right? Like, just the basic, the editing and pacing is terrible. The sound effects, 
Like, when he, when he throws him and there's some kind of like missile bomb sound effect because he threw him three feet, it's like, what is that, right? Maybe some of that is structural too, like the pacing at least, because when you have to stretch things out between commercials, you sort of have to work with what, what you've got. But, um, you know, that, the real reason you had that was because people could get away with it. And again, I want to reemphasize, that was a top show. That was not the bottom of the barrel. I mean, there were shows that we would see today as, as being indisputably better, right? Like MASH was on contemporarily with this, and that was a much better show probably. Uh, but, well, we'll talk about that more later. So, enough about television. Let's talk about games for a little bit. Um, we're at a point now where we've got a fair bit of history of games behind us. Um, and we've seen this trajectory of games happen technologically. And the thing that I want to focus on here is how the container of what a game was has changed over time. And again, how that affected the design, right? So back when games first started to be commercially exploited in a big way, you would tend to play them in arcade cabinets like this one on the left. Um, then at some point, you tended to have home machines where you could play games uh, in, in the comfort of your own home without going anywhere. Um, and that lasted for quite a while until just a few years ago. And I'm making a break point in a differentiation uh, between then and now. The home machines still exist, but now we have these very powerful computing devices that pretty much everyone has and carries with them everywhere. And they're not specifically made for games, but they do a pretty good job at playing certain kinds of games. And so this has created a big explosion in the market for what games are and in, in the perception of what games are in the public. So let's talk about arcade cabinets for a second. Um, how did these affect the design of games at the time? Well, uh, through very basic financial constraints again, right? An arcade cabinet was expensive to build. If you were an arcade operator, you know, you had, to, you had to make back that money before you could start making any money, right? So as an arcade operator, you wanted games uh, where you knew people were going to just be plunking a lot of quarters in, right? Um, the, so, so the design of these games very deliberately at the time was, you know, we expect to get a quarter out of you every... 90 seconds to three minutes. Like that was the short time frame. And so, so what that leads to in terms of game design is that these games all tend to be action challenges where you know, you're worried about getting killed or something and after you get killed a certain number of times, it's time to put a new quarter in. That's pretty much what video games were during this time. Um, once we started having home systems of various sorts, uh, well, let me just say actually, So here's an example of a commercial constraint dictating uh, the form of what gets created. And that's something that pretty much always happens. Uh, this one, uh, I would claim, is a little bit unpleasant, just like the, just like the you know, commercial breaks and syndication were with television. This sort of tends to be a, at least a mildly invasive constraint that seriously affects what you're able to do in the medium. And that, that would have been pretty bad. Um, and it probably was a little bit bad for a while. But what happened is that this era, when we got home machines, came pretty quickly after that. Um, and what happened with home machines is, you, you know, there's no longer an arcade operator who has to make his money back. Um, you know, you want to justify the fun that you got. You're, you want to have enough fun to justify the money you spent on this home machine, but that's a little bit of an easier, more casual problem to solve. The machine exists for years. You can buy games for it over the course of years. Um, and what happened is we got longer form games that weren't trying to kill you in a couple minutes. And we got some maturation of the medium to some extent, um, where you started to see more interesting subjects being approached. Uh, e even early in this cycle, you saw things that would have been blatantly impossible in a video arcade, right? You had flight simulators where you take off from a runway and you're in the air for two hours of real time, and then you land, and not, not very much happens. Uh, except your gauges twiddle a little bit. And the interest in that game is all about the verisimilitude of your flight instruments and the flight model of, of the vehicle, right? That was a whole genre. 
Um, you had text adventure games where it describes to you what's happening in text and you like type what you want to do and it says, okay, well that, this happened and that happened, right? Those things just can't exist in the arcade because the container of the arcade is very different from that. So, you know, that went on for a while and I think we're all at least a little bit familiar with that. And then we get to sort of lately, um, all that stuff still exists, it's not going away. Um, and actually, so, so during this whole time, there was a little bit of a mantra that game developers had, or a question at least, which was, you know, we would work very hard on our games and we saw all these beautiful things about them and there, there was this question of, when are games gonna really go mainstream? Like, when, when is society at large gonna really see what we see in these games and appreciate it and, you know, start respecting it or something? You know, everybody had different uh, angles on this question. Well, I, you don't hear that very much anymore. Um, Partially because games have become much more mainstream. Um, alongside this free-to-play business model, which is how games, is part of the expansion of, of how games reached a lot of people. So you had platforms like Facebook on the left, where a lot of people ended up with, ended up interacting with for reasons other than playing video games. But then it was found to be a successful place to get people into certain kinds of games if you made those games free and if you changed the design of those games in such a way uh, to increase virality and such, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then now you have an equivalent thing. Actually, this game on the right, Candy Crush, is on both Facebook and iOS. Uh, this is the iOS version. Um, so iOS is similar, people come to these kinds of devices for reasons other than games usually. They like want a good phone or a web browser or something. Um, but then the games exploit that niche and in so they're able to reach a much broader uh, set of people. However, this isn't really what game designers were envisioning back when we thought when are games going to go mainstream. Um, there's a lot of downsides to what's happening right now. Um, let me go through them for a second. So uh, delivery of free-to-play games, abbreviated F2P commonly, um, is a lot more like TV delivery than cinema delivery, right? You download the game for free. Someone doesn't really have expectations of your game necessarily. They just stumbled into it. Like, what is this? And they start interacting with it. And from that point, the job of the game is to convince the person who downloaded the game to give them money, right? Very different from the older style of games, which is, or the middle style of games, which is more cinema-like, where once you've entered into the doors of this walled garden, you're sort of in a beautiful place where commercial uh, ulterior motives aren't really happening so much, right? So the design is more like a TV style design, and the audience is more like a TV style audience, right? They don't have expectations. They don't even, like a lot of people playing games on iOS who might play Candy Crush in the airport while they're waiting for their plane, they probably didn't play, you know, Final Fantasy VII or something on a, uh, you know, they, they don't have that much experience with the history of games. So you can't even expect them to like, you know, know what's ostensibly a good game or a bad game. Um, now, this free-to-play business model, just like commercials are not a thing where you just insert some, or, some more commercial breaks into your TV show and then you're done, you have to design the TV show completely around the fact that there are commercial breaks. With a free-to-play game, you have the equivalent of that, which is times when you want to get money out of people. Little micropayments, 99 cents at a time, um, or more if the game is particularly brazen. And it's not just that you can insert those into an existing game. You have to design the entire structure of the game to work around those payments. And what you end up with is a very different type of thing than you either could have had in the arcades or in this period of home machines, right? And once again, I think it swings us way back toward the negative in terms of the bearing of the designer toward the audience. Because your job becomes less about giving the audience a beautiful thing and much more about exploiting them or misleading them. And there's a long list of practices that modern free-to-play games do. Um, I, there's no way that I could recap them all in less than probably eight hours of speaking, so I won't. 
Um, I'll just go through a couple that, these don't exist in all uh, free-to-play games, but uh, they're, they're typical. You would find many of these in many free-to-play games, right? So these games tend to try to ensnare people in the game for as long as possible, right? Uh, often by building some kind of infinite treadmill of apparent progress, where it looks like you're accomplishing things, but the game is designed so that the things you're accomplishing are completely illusionary, right? This is actually something that happened in more traditional games, but has been appropriated to slightly more sinister ends now. Um, these games will try to interrupt your life as often as possible with push notifications. They'll try to get you to bug your friends to like pass the game to your friends like a disease or something. Um, they've even appropriated some elements of classic game design like tutorials, right? In, in you know, for a while, uh, especially, you know, in the, in the 90s or whatever, when tutorials really started happening, um, games were getting really complicated and people would sit down in front of a game and they didn't know how to play. And, and so the goal of a tutorial was just to, to tell you, like, here's how you play this game and, and here's how you get good at it and know what's going on and stuff. And a tutorial was entirely for the benefit of the player, right? That's been subverted. So now if you play a modern free-to-play game, the tutorial is kind of telling you what the game's about but it's also kind of training you to spend money, right? So the game will be like, look, you're building that factory, but man, it's gonna take two hours to of real time to build that factory, and you're gonna have to come back later, and that's just really a drag, but look, if you only spend eight glitter bucks, you can build this factory right away, and you have 20 in the bank account, look. And, and so just do that, and, and by the way, you can't go on to the next step of the tutorial until you do that, right? So they force you, to do this transaction that's not commercial yet because they gave you some free glitter bucks and they'll continue giving you some free ones for a while so you're used to spending them, but that supply dwindles. Um, but you've trained the player to spend those things and then you show them how to buy them for real money, right? So a tutorial stops being uh, for the benefit of the player and starts being a little bit against the player's best interest, right? Um, it, one of the most devious practices is to give the player a reward, or ostensibly give the player a reward, and then threaten to take it away, right? There's a psychological phenomenon called loss aversion, where people just, once they've got something that they really want, it's really painful to have it taken away. It's more painful than not to have gotten the thing in the first place. So, you know, games like Puzzles and Dragons, if you guys have seen that, do this. Um, where you're, you're fighting through a series of encounters and in the middle, one of the middle encounters that aren't that hard, you know, after every one, uh, you get some random treasure like you do in all these uh, dungeon exploration kinds of games. And one of these random treasure items happens to be this amazing item that you really wanted. Wow, that's gonna, that's gonna make life a lot better. It's not really gonna make life a lot better because there's a treadmill, right? But you think it is. So, uh, and then you get to the final encounter of the dungeon and it's really this hard boss monster and he kicks your ass and, you, and you're losing and it's like, wow, if I lose, um, I'm gonna have to run away from the dungeon and lose all my treasure and lose this amazing thing that I just got. Um, that's no good. And, and the game comes along and gives this proposition like, well, if you just pay 99 cents, you can have this one-time use item to beat this boss monster and you know, that's not that bad. Uh, it's just once and, and you'll get to keep this thing. And uh, the, the human mind is not very good at resisting offers like that. And the designers know this. Um, now, when, when you talk to game designers about this kind of issue, they'll often be in denial in a, in a way that bugs me. Um, you know, they'll say some things that, that maybe have a, a little bit of a kernel of truth to them, but, but that really are, to my mind, excuses, right? So the first thing is, uh, well, this is the future. All games are going to be this way, so you might as well get used to it. And, you know, there's a little bit of reason to actually believe that. Um, partially because there's been this explosion. If you look at, if you look at these free-to-play games on iOS, uh, they have a huge number of people playing them and uh, they're making huge amounts of money. And once a certain number of games are free to play, if you're gonna come along and say, well, you have to pay $10 to play my game, it's easy to think, well, why would anyone ever pay $10 to play that game? There's all this other stuff for free. So there's that factor. Um, and there's also the factor that, uh, you know, the, the pay, the pay uh, to play part of the game industry has traditionally had a lot of problems that are perhaps getting worse, like piracy. Um, on PCs, piracy rates are like 90%, um, which is to say that 
10% of the people who play your game actually paid you for it, right? And when, when you see numbers like that, they're not as bad in consoles, but it's still a problem on game consoles as well. Um, and when you see things like that, you start looking for ways to solve that problem. And free-to-play games inherently have an online component, right? Um, which, which means that piracy just doesn't work, right? I mean, you're trying to give the game out for free anyway, so people who pirate the game are sort of just helping you at that point. Um, so there's, uh, there's a, a little bit of a, a scary potential that, that this is true and that all games will be this way in the future. Um, I don't believe it necessarily, right? Because television didn't make cinema go away. Even today, now that movies are really kind of bad most of the time, um, people go to the movies when they could, you know, they could just watch TV shows on their iPad or they could download them off Pirate Bay or something. Like, um, movies still exist. Another thing designers say is that this doesn't change the nature of good game design. You're, you're, just, you're still a good game designer. You're just working in a different format. But the case that I've been trying to make here is that that's completely untrue. Like anyone, the, the only way you can believe this bottom statement is if you have a vested interest in believing it. Um, because it, I think it's obvious to anyone who actually looks that the form of what you're making, the structural constraints on it dictate what you actually can make, right? Um, the shape of a container determines what can be contained, right? We see that with television versus movies. We see that with arcade games versus home games. It's universally true. So now I want to talk about, um, I, want, I want to get a little less negative and talk about some games uh, that have come about lately that I think do things that are very interesting that wouldn't necessarily work in a free-to-play kind of framework, and, and I'll talk about why in each case. So this game called Gone Home is made by a small team called the Fulbright Company here in Portland, actually. Um, this game, uh, in this game, you play a girl who's in college and has been studying abroad for a year, and you're coming back home uh, to sort of reunite with your family. They've moved into a different house uh, during that year, so you don't even know the layout of the house. And for some reason, when you get home, everybody's gone. So you spend this game wandering around this house, like looking through notes, reading diaries and stuff like that. And you're, you as the player are reconstructing the story of what's been going on with your family for the past year. It's a very dramatic story. It's a very personal story. And playing this game is, um, is an experience that's about caring about the characters, right? It's about, um, it's a very personal game, right? Um, it's about very personal human issues. And th there's a lot of ways. So let's, let's do an exercise. You know, we want to make a, a free-to-play version of this game. Well, first of all, it, it can't any longer be a two-hour long game that's some kind of self-enclosed, satisfactory, nugget of story. It has to now be infinitely long if it's going to be free-to-play, or at least so long and extensible that by the time people get toward the end, you can build new content, right? So it couldn't be a story about a family anymore. You might have to do something really massive about a whole world full of many people, and it, at some point, doesn't that start to get impersonal? You could maybe pull it off. If you tried to do the video game version of like Lost or something, you could try to pull that off, but Lost couldn't even do Lost, right? <laughs> so um, so that's, a, that's a problem. Um, but also, this is a game where you, you're supposed to be caring deeply about what has happened to these people. And that becomes spoiled when you start to inject these commercial moments into the game. So you could imagine the free-to-play version of this, which is like, oh, you found a note from your sister Sam, and peeling open the corner, it looks a little bit lurid, and what does it say? But you can't tell because there's like bubblegum sticking the note together. But for only 99 cents, you can get a bubblegum dissolver pellet and like open the note, and you'll be able to read it. And it's like that, that taints a lot of things. Like you just can't, you can't get the same emotional response out of people in that kind of situation. It's not possible. Um, here's another game called Papers, Please. Came out within the past couple months uh, by Lucas Kovar. Um, this is a game where you staff uh, an immigration checkpoint for a fictional Eastern European country. 
and you inspect people's paperwork and decide whether to let them into the country or not. Um, sounds very tedious, uh, and it is a little bit tedious, but it's actually really uh, fun and interesting to play as well. Um, you very quickly end up with issues like, wow, how dirty do I feel about the fact that I just uh, took, a, took a nude scan of this person to see, look, he had contraband, so that was good that I did that, right? Um, he probably doesn't know he's being nude scanned. Uh, what's interesting about this game is it brings up uh, issues about you know, immigration issues and privacy issues in ways that, that make them very real to the player, right? A, a question like immigration is, is the kind of subject where it's very easy to have an ill-informed opinion that's very strong about that subject, right? And many people do. Uh, but when you put it in a game, you make people confront the issues for real because it's like, wow, I, I have to do a good job at this immigration checkpoint. Uh, or I get fired, or maybe I sort of want to get fired, um, or you know, do I, do I want to help subvert uh, this fascist state that is sort of becoming more and more fascist and, and that I don't like the tenor of? Um, <laughs> so I'm glad that people laugh when I put these up together because these are very different kinds of games. So, so if you try to make the free-to-play version of Papers, Please, I think it starts to be about these kinds of decisions, right? So in Papers, Please, you make really hard choices like, wow, this woman's paperwork is not really in order, uh, but she says she's going to get killed for political reasons if she's rejected at this checkpoint. Do I let her through or not, right? Or, you know, this woman wants to see her son, who she's been away from for a year, and her, her papers aren't in order, but it's only expired by a couple days, and it's not a, it's not a big deal. Do I let her through, um, or, or do I reject her, right? Those are difficult and interesting choices that build in complexity and sophistication over this game, right? In Candy Crush, the choices are like, well, I, I could win this level, but if, uh, or I'm about to lose this level, but I'm not that far from losing it, so if I buy this power up for 99 cents, you know, maybe I can strategically use it in a way that gets me through the level, right? That's like a totally different realm of choices. So first of all, it's kind of a selfish choice in Candy Crush, right? Like I'm buying something to make me more powerful. In Papers, Please, you need to make selfish choices because otherwise you lose, but you're always balancing those selfish choices on a, nice, on a knife edge of what you feel comfortable about actually doing. And again, once you, um, once you inject commercialism into these choices themselves, once they pervade the game and it's like, well, you could, you know, you could uh, scan this guy um, to see if he has contraband, but you're out of x-ray plates and an x-ray plate costs 99 cents. Um, that <laughs> is just not the same game anymore, right? You're not weighing the issues in the same way. Here's a game. Um, this one's a little subtler and, and harder to talk about, uh, but it's uh, The Binding of Isaac uh, by a friend of mine named Ed Mc, Edmund McMillan, and this game takes place against this sort of background of weird insular Christianity that happens a lot in America. Um, I know this firsthand because I grew up a, at least a little bit in that kind of situation. Um, and the, you know, the story of the game is that Isaac's mother uh, hears a voice from God paralleling the, the biblical story that, that orders her to kill her son. And uh, the game, uh, so, so Isaac flees into the basement, and the game then sort of takes place in his twisted imagination uh, as he goes deeper and deeper into the basement, more twisted and crazy things happen. Um, but the game as a whole, if I, if I step away from the fictional part for a second, um, is about uh, possibility. It's about having this rich space where a lot of things can happen, and the game keeps getting bigger and bigger the more that you play it, and more and more intricate and crazy things can happen, and you, know, you can get items that you can use together in really interesting ways that you didn't foresee. So there's some kind of, uh, there's a feeling of bounty to this game. There's a feeling like, I don't know what's gonna happen this time, when I play, it's a game that you play repeatedly um, in different runs and, and each one goes differently. So you don't know what's gonna happen. You know that it may be very different from what you just played. Um, you know that you can make important decisions that are skill-based, right? And once you start gating 
content behind paywalls, that feeling of bounty isn't there anymore. It's not magical. It's like, well, I, I paid for more stuff, so I get more stuff, right? It's, it, the game isn't generous anymore. And generosity is important um, for a reason I'll talk about in a second. So let me try to get into some takeaways here. So if you're a game player and not a game maker, and you're playing this kind of game right now, really what I can ask is just know that what you're doing is the new version of watching bad TV in the 70s. Just like you don't necessarily know that this is bad TV right now, people watching the $6 million man were not cognitively aware of how terrible that show was most of the time, right? Um, it's only in retrospect that we can stand where we are now and look back at that and say, wow, that, that show was terrible. Same with these games, right? You're swimming in them, so you can't see how bad they really are. Um, and know that just like, like I can look back at the 80s and, and say, man, I can't believe I spent so many hours watching like frickin' Knight Rider and Airwolf and uh, the A-Team and, and all that stuff. Um, it's gonna be very easy to look back in 10 or 15 years and say, I can't believe I played so many of these frickin' illusionary treadmill games, right? Um, and a, and a common response to that kind of statement is, well, I, you know, I sort of hear what you're saying, but I don't believe it because it's my experience when I'm playing a game like Candy Crush that I'm having fun and there's nothing wrong with that. And this is also what designers say, right? Like designers who want to make this kind of game and convince you that it's not a crappy game or whatever, they just say, well, people have fun playing it and who are you to judge, right? And it's like, well, sort of, but in other areas of life, we don't have this level of confusion, right? Like a lot of people like going to McDonald's and eating McDonald's french fries. They'll tell you that they taste good, but there's not really any confusion that this is good food, right? Nobody thinks this is good food. Nobody thinks you should eat this every day. Um, but in games, that level of clarity has not been reached yet. Um, so the nice thing though, um, if you've played this kind of game on the left, is to know that there actually is better stuff out there. Um, there's stuff that can actually speak to you as a human being beyond just a bundle of reflexes that can be psychologically manipulated. Um, and, and if you're playing these kind of games on the left, it at least means that you're maybe a little bit interested in games to begin with. So if you wanted to do a little bit of scouting uh, and had good advice, you could find the kinds of things like are on the right. Um, and you might find them much more interesting. Maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you'd go back to playing Candy Crush. Who knows? But it's a possibility. Now, if, if you make games, so first of all, just be aware if you're making this kind of game, you're making the new bad TV, right? You're making the new $6 million man. Except it's worse because it's more manipulative, right? The way that we get money in free-to-play games from our customers is more coercive and more manipulative than television ever was, right? And so the relationship between the designer and the audience is more nefarious. And that's, so for me, um, a, someone who identifies as a game designer, it's important to me what I do from day to day. I wanna feel good about what I do, like, like anybody does, right? And so I find it's important to me to look at what I'm doing, to take a careful eye about how am I approaching my audience, um, because that, that when, when, I, when I design things hour after hour, day after day, those help determine who I am, right? I don't think you can do something 40 hours a week without it affecting who you are. So it's like, am I, am I working hard? Am I respecting my audience? Um, or am I trying to nickel and dime them? Am I trying to exploit them, right? That's very important to me. And uh, in case this, all of this doesn't make that much sense to people, um, I want to talk a little bit about the target that I'm, that I'm aiming for. Um, what I personally aspire to as a designer, um, and maybe it'll make some of this make a little more sense. What I'm about to read from is a short section of a lecture on game design called The Secret of Psalm 46 by Brian Moriarty, who's one of the designers who came before me that I respect most tremendously. And uh, leading into this section, just to establish context, uh, he's talking about the King James Bible and the works of Shakespeare. Contemplating these dazzling jewels of wisdom and eloquence, 
gives rise to an extraordinary feeling, a potent, rare, and precious emotion with the potential to completely upset your life. An emotion powerful enough to make a man abandon his wife and children, forfeit career and reputation, lay down his possessions, and follow his heart without questioning. That sweet, sweet fusion of wonder and fear, irresistible attraction and soul-numbing dread, known as awe. Awe is the grail of artistic achievement. No other human emotion possesses such raw, transformative power, and none is more difficult to evoke. Few and far between are the works of man that qualify as truly awesome. It is awe that convinces a rabbi to spend a lifetime decoding Yahweh from the Pentateuch. Awe that sends millions of visitors each year to the pyramids of Giza, Guadalupe, and Mecca. Awesome things don't hold anything back. Awesome things are rich and generous. The treasure is right there. So that's, that's a high bar to aspire to. Um, and I don't know that I will ever make it. I don't know that I will ever create a work that is truly awesome in the sense that Brian means, but um, I'm sure gonna try. And I think that anyone who tries uh, that kind of endeavor uh, with full um, forthrightness, um, with full honesty, like not just kidding themselves that they're trying to do that, but really, really putting everything they have as a designer into trying to do that. Um, even if you don't make it, it puts you into a very rare and privileged group of individuals. And so that's really what I'm aiming for. And so if, if these complaints about free-to-play games don't make much sense to you, um, here's a couple questions that can maybe help them make more sense. If you play games, Think about that feeling of awe, like something that's more important than anything else in the world to you. You might have felt a little bit of that reading a novel or seeing a film or seeing a beautiful painting or sculpture. And you might ask, what kind of game would it have to be to evoke that feeling? And, and what does that game look like? And does that game look anything like Candy Crush or Farmville, right? Is that game, can that game inspire feelings of awe while also saying, and just for 99 cents, you can have a little benefit here? Is that even possible, right? Now, if you make games, there's a longer term question about what would it take if I were to become the kind of designer who can make things that truly inspire awe, along with the, the great artists, whoever your choice of great artists are, what would it take, what would the trajectory of my career have to be to get me from here to there? How hard would I have to work? What kinds of things would I have to work on? How would I have to treat my audience to get there? And can I do that? Can I have that kind of personal and career development if I'm spending all, you know, eight hours a day figuring out how to nickel and dime people for micropayments, right? Is that possible <laughs> or does that prevent such developments? So I think I will uh, conclude the official remarks there and we probably have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, so we'll, we'll take questions now. Thank you.